I have to apologize here to you guys that you have to look at my face in high definition. You know, it's tough when you have a 480p face in a 1080p world. Hey guys, good morning. Today on Vantage Speed Garage, we're going to be working on the front brake system on our 66 Mustang project and I've got some bitchin' parts here that we're going to be installing. So what we've got here is the disc brake conversion that we're going to be putting on the front of our 66 Mustang project. And there's a lot of different disc brake conversions out there. Um, most of them are very high priced. This one was actually very reasonable and I'm hoping that this is going to be as great as I think it is. And uh, the kit comes with everything you need. It comes with uh, two calipers. I'm going to get to these here in a second. It comes with a one-piece rotor here that's machined to fit our application. Um, both sets of bearings, seals, dust caps to go uh, onto your rotors after you install them. And all grade 8 hardware, which is pretty awesome in my opinion. Now what really makes this kit unique is that uh, rather than being your standard disc brake caliper with a single piston this kit has not one not two not three which would be kind of weird but four pistons this is a four pot caliper we've got uh, two pistons here two pistons here and these are very high performance caliper set up for a lightweight car like our 66 Mustang so we ought to be able to stop on a dime and give you change um, on our Mustang and to go along with the disc brake conversion that we're installing today um, once uh, once we receive the master cylinder booster setup we'll have power brakes in the Mustang right now we've got a all manual braking system with drums all the way around so I figured if we were going to do a brake upgrade on the front of the Mustang and I could get a four pot caliper for about the same price as a single pot caliper brake setup, uh, why not, right? Uh, the more pistons the better as far as I'm concerned. So this should be a great upgrade for our project car here and give us the stopping power that we need for Southern California stops in traffic uh, and the long road, cr road trips um, in the Mustang that I'm hoping the owner is going to feel comfortable and confident doing after all of the work that we're getting done here on the Mustang. So that's enough talking about it. Let's start turning some wrenches, get this old brake drum uh, off, the old brake lines off, get all of that stuff off, out of the way, and start test fitting our components into place. Last one's always the hardest one, right? So there we go. That's our complete backing plate with wheel cylinder on it. Alright, so now with everything disconnected here, uh, we just have to remove the lower control arm itself. And there we go. One removed lower control arm. Our new replacement part uh, includes the ball joint and the bushings all in one complete assembly. So this whole piece is going straight in the dumpster. Well guys, we ran into a little bit of a snag here on the suspension replacement on our 66 Mustang project. Um, the passenger side front shock tower here uh, is cracked and I'm going to show you that here in a second. Um, and there's no uh, better time to fix it than now. And so I'm going to show you here, see if we can see this on the camera. But this is the front mounting hole uh, of the two that mount our upper control arm. And this is the front side. And there was a little bit of a dent here. And I thought I better look a little closer. So I started scraping. And uh, 
what you can see is there's a bunch of spider cracks. There's three cracks right here and one big one that goes all the way up here to this upper uh, upper plug weld here on the two pieces of the shock tower. So, um, like I said around here we roll with the punches so I'm going to drill out both ends of those cracks um, grind down a, a nice little V uh, into each one of them and weld them up. Uh, I've also got to inspect the driver's side. I haven't removed that upper control arm yet so I'm going to do the same on that side take a look uh, a little more closely than I did initially on this side and um, make sure there's no cracking going on on that side either. Okay guys, well, the uh, story is much the same here on the driver's side shock tower of our Mustang. Sure. So, I'm not sure how well you can see this, but we've got a couple good cracks that are running at all angles here on our front shock tower mount. So. That's going to have to be welded, ground down, welded. Going to have to grind those out, uh, weld them up, grind down the welds, paint it, and uh, continue on with the uh, assembly here on the driver's side. Kind of a bummer. Okay guys, well, like I said, this ain't going to be a uh, pretty stack of dimes lap joint. This is, uh, you know, real world welding, uh, <laughs> you know, crack repair. And uh, this material to start with is probably 18 gauge. And when I grind it out and I grind half of that crack out so that when I weld over the crack, I actually burn through it and eliminate the crack altogether. Um, you know, when you grind that down, you take that 18 gauge and you take almost half of it away, there's not much metal there. So you don't have time to sit in one place and put too much heat into there uh, because you'll just pop a hole and then you'll be in big trouble. So, uh, you know, that's why the welds aren't, aren't so pretty. They're not sunk in as deep as, uh, you know, it may appear, but those are burned all the way through to the back side of the panel. Um, you know, this is double layer, so... That helps a little bit because you get the heat, heat sink of the second panel behind it. Um, but really all I'm trying to do is burn out that crack, watch my puddle, run through it, and, uh, and replace the, the cracked steel with filler metal. And, uh, and then I'll grind the top down flush and we'll be in good shape. You know, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not attractive, but it's how you do it. And... Uh, I think I think we have a good solid repair there. Um, you know, maybe maybe the cracks weren't uh, structural because they weren't on the inner panel, just on the outside skin. Uh, I'm guessing somebody really torqued the hell out of those upper control arm bolts at the alignment shop, and uh, on this side anyway. And that's probably what pinched that steel down and cracked it, uh, and flattened it out and cracked it. So you saw me do a lot of filling in there to try and bring that level back up. So that when I grind it all down, I'll have a nice flat surface there on the shock tower. So it's just for uh, aesthetic reasons, just so that it looks flat um, and doesn't have that that uh, sunk in spot anymore. So I spent a lot of time filling that in um, so that I could grind it down and hopefully make it look halfway decent here. So now comes the glorious part of welding, and that's the grinding. So... Uh, I'm going to get the grinder out here and knock this down 
and progressively step down my uh, uh, to finer grits here. Okay guys, so we repaired the shock tower on the driver's side of our 66 Mustang and now we're ready to reassemble. Uh, we're going to start with the upper control arm, we're going to mount that in the two relocated holes that uh, our, our Shelby drop that lowers the upper control arm down. We're going to use those holes. The shims that I pulled out, I'm probably going to have to reduce the number of shims. I don't think I'm going to get all those through there because of the increased thickness. Uh, in the new mounting location for these uh, bolts but we're gonna give it a shot after that very important don't forget your bump stop do your upper control arm first then install your bump stop because once you put the coil in place you're not gonna be able to get this guy tightened up so first things first let's get our upper control arm located in its new mounting location And we'll see if we can get this giant stack of shims in here. Still have enough threads to start our nuts. So the second item I'm going to install here is our bump stop. Because like I said, you cannot get to this nut with the coil spring in place. So put your bump stop in. Sorry about that. Okay, so now our upper control arm is located and uh, our bump stops in place. I'm going to go ahead and throw the lower just enough that it's free to move. So with our lower control arm in place, now we need to install, install the strut rod with your new bushings. Waver. Okay, so your strut rod has a top and a bottom, it has a slight curve to it, so you want to make sure that's sitting flat against your lower control arm. Put your big washer on first, one of your first bushings through the hole, big bushing, washer, and nut. Okay, the strut rod's held in place with our steering stop, which is here. That goes through the strut rod and into the lower control. Next up, we'll put our steering knuckle in place. Just loosely and install the uh, spring perch. And this comes with new hardware. And then your 
nuts and bolts. I put the nuts on top. Probably do it either way. I don't think it much matters. All right, and like I said, at any point during this assembly, you could continue on uh, assembling the coil. I'm going to save the coil here for last because I enjoy that so much. And I'm going to do uh, our sway bar mounting bushings here. And I'll just leave that loose for now. The first thing you want to do is test fit your coil perch into your upper controller and make sure that it falls into place easily. You don't want to be fighting that while you have a spring under tension inches above your hands. So in our case, our coil spring perch on the driver's side anyway drops into our upper control arm just fine. On the passenger side it didn't. I had to actually take a bit and run through those holes, clean them up uh, so that the perch would fall into place. It didn't want to go in. If I had the spring in there under tension and uh, I was trying to get that coil perch in underneath the spring, it just would have been uh, it would have been much more difficult uh, to drill out with the coil spring in the way, spring compressor and everything else. So make sure your perch fits uh, before you move on to installing your coil spring. Coil spring installs with the flat side of the spring up. And don't forget your isolator. These are new polyurethane isolators that I ordered. And we're going to jam that up into our shock tower. But before I do that, I've got to remove the camera up here that's uh, monitoring what we're doing. Okay guys, so we've got everything ready to go here to shove our coil spring up into position. I'm using an internal uh, coil spring compressor and the way I'm doing it is uh, I'll put the spring up into the shock tower loosely just loosely positioned so it doesn't fall out and then I'm going to use the shoe and our compressor and drop that down into the center of the coil spring. Uh, once that's in I'll put a little tension on it, get our arms here around the coils of our coil spring and, uh, and then position the shoe so that we can pull straight up on this coil and try and get it here into our coil perch on the first shot. The coil perch has a stop for the end of the coil spring and that goes inside. So when you mount it into your upper control arm, put the, uh, the stop and the dead end of the spring into the stop here. That, that's the inside of the coil perch. Inside the shaft here of our spring compressor through the coil spring. Just kind of grab that spring. Just kind of grab that spring. Position. Stick the shoe. Actually, I like the shoe in the front. Underneath the washers that are going to provide some pivoting ability here for the bolt as we tighten it. And try and get that centered on the uh, shock. Put a little tension on it and make sure that your isolator is in the right position and your coil spring is, is sitting where you want it. Okay, so being that the dead end of our coil needs to sit into the coil perch against our stop here, or pretty close, um, you want to make sure you position that correctly because once you put tension on this coil spring, you're not going to be able to rotate it uh, very much at all. Um, so get it, get it positioned where you want it before you start tightening up uh, the spring compressor and putting tension on the coil spring. Okay, so 
so now with your coil spring compressed, uh, not, not all the way, but uh, about halfway up, I compressed it about five inches in length. Um, now we can install the coil spring perch and get the dead end of our coil into our coil stop on the perch. And while this thing is under tension, you want to be mindful of where your hands are at. You know, if, if that thing was to break or uh, somehow release the tension on that coil, you, you want to be able to get out of the way at a minimum or keep your hands out of the way so you don't lose a finger. I notice a lot of old mechanics are missing fingers. I currently have all ten of mine. And I want to keep it that way. One important step I forgot. Uh, put your jack, your floor jack under the lower control arm and jack it up so you don't have to release all the tension off the coil spring. The compressor. Okay, so with the spring compressor removed and tension from the floor jack here holding uh, pressure on our coil spring, now we need to install our shock because the shock is actually what holds this all together so that the coil spring doesn't fly out every time you go through a dip. So for shocks on our 66 Mustang project here, I went with KYB. It's a gas charge performance shock. It's not the uh, most aggressive valving that you could probably get in a street shock, but I think for our Mustang project, they'll work just fine. We'll lower that down through our upper controller. On the top here, just a bolt and a washer. Okay guys, well today we wrapped up the front suspension replacement on our 66 Mustang project and I showed you guys how to repair cracked shock towers if you happen to run into that problem like we did on both the passenger and driver side here of our uh, 30 30 year idle Mustang. And it's a good thing we replaced all of these suspension components because uh, there's not much that's uh, any good on any of these rubber components. They're all just trash. I still have to go through and finish a couple things uh, on the project. I've got to grease and pack all of our bearings on the front end, install the grease seals in the back of the rotors. Uh, these rotors are a one piece hub and rotor assembly, so I've got to install that grease seal after I pack the bearings, and then we are done uh, on the front end of our Mustang. Next up is going to be the back end of the Mustang. I've got to replace all of the drum brake hardware and hard lines and flexible lines on the back of our Mustang so, we, so we're ready for our power master cylinder and booster setup that I'm going to install here this week. The 15 inch Magnum 500s are fitting very well, uh, 15 by 8s. Uh, I think a more appropriate wheel size for the front of an early Mustang like this is a 7 inch wide rim. But the 8s are going to clear the ball joints okay. I think uh, I'd, I'd rather have a 7 with a wider tire. I'm going to be limited in tire width. I'm not going to be able to run a 225 like I wanted to. I'm going to have to run probably a 215 on uh, at least on the front of our Mustang here. But that should be okay. I want to run the same size tire all the way around. I don't want to stagger them because this car is going to be driven and it's going to be maintained. Tire rotations are a normal part of maintenance and uh, if I stagger the tire sizes that's going to kind of limit what you can do with rotation uh, to keep those tires fresh. You saw me do the Shelby drop on the front uh, upper control arms on our Mustang. Uh, there's no better time to do it than with the front end torn apart so I went ahead and did that. Um, I don't think uh, that's going to be a problem. In fact I think it's going to be a big plus because the, the Shelby drop what that does is uh, gives you a lower center of gravity on the front end and 
uh, prevents uh, pushing in the corners. So we should get a little bit better handling. It'll be a little bit looser probably in the rear end, like everybody likes to drive a rear uh, rear drive car. So uh, I don't think that's a problem. I think that's a big plus. And I think it's going to make our Mustang handle a little bit closer to a GT350. Probably not quite as good, but um, maybe we'll do a bigger sway bar here down the road. And some roller coil uh, perches. The, the perches I used on here are just OEM replacements. Uh, that's what I did on all of the suspension components on the front. With a few exceptions, I used polyurethane, but primarily it's all just rubber stuff because we're just doing replacements. We're not uh, we're not doing a performance upgrade on the front end here. So yeah, the mission the last couple of days here went well. I think we got a lot of good work done. Um, I'm glad to have found those cracks and repaired them on both sides of the Mustang. I think that's a big uh, big plus, big improvement, and. Uh, will prevent those cracks from spreading even further and causing uh, causing us real problems and rust uh, in the front end of our Mustang. So now that's all sealed up, ground down, repainted, everything's good up there so uh, we shouldn't have any rust problems going on. Uh, I also vacuumed out the little pocket underneath the control arms in the front coil buckets on both sides and that's something that you need to do if you have one of these early Mustangs. I guarantee it's plugged up with dirt and those drain holes are not able to drain out water so if you drive your car in the rain and you collect a bunch of water there and it, it soaks into that grease and dirt and rust uh, it's just going to further rot out uh, the, those areas in the Mustang on the inside firewall uh, on your engine compartment and your coil, coil tower, your shock tower. So get out the shop vac, get out a screwdriver, clean those areas out, repaint them or uh, paint them with some rust preventative paint if you have any rust going on in there. Get that area taken care of so it can drain out uh, the way it was designed to do. So yeah guys, I'm real happy with the way those four piston calipers are fitting on the front of our Mustang. Behind our 15 inch wheels, everything fits really well, clears good. Uh, I don't have any interference problems turning full lock both directions. Uh, once there's a front end alignment done on the car, that may change and we may have to space out the wheels a little bit to gain some extra clearance. Um, like an eighth of an inch or so, so it shouldn't be shouldn't be a problem. And if you follow me on Instagram, you might have seen a little hint uh, as to what Kevin's next project is on his big blue badass F-350 project. He has a big, uh, big swap that's coming up. It's a big change to his truck. I think it's going to make that truck work much better for him for what he does with it. And you're not going to want to miss that one. So stay tuned for that. Uh, for this video tonight, guys, that's it. I'm done. I need a, the rest of this beer in a hot shower. Thank you for watching. Uh, if you think the video was halfway decent, please give me a like and subscribe if you're new.